So this is a, this presentation is going to be on um, you know presenting the site model or building the site model um, for a qualitative risk assessment. It's uh, Cassie Wagner put this presentation together, um, and I will try to do the best I can covering it. So our learning objectives are explain the difference between the SQRA and the QRA, and then describe how focused geologic data is used in the risk assessment. You guys have been doing exercises today. You've seen a couple case studies, so you're starting to get the picture of how we use the geologic data. Um, we're going to work on identifying data gaps and how to communicate geologic information to everyone on the team. And we're going to describe, finally, um, necessary components of the FIPS and DIPS, uh, field investigation plans and the drilling plans. So um, the, here's the outline we're going to cover. Um, we're going to do a little introduction, and then we're going to go to the data interpretation and portrayal. Then we're going to be pulling the data together, layering it, um, analyzing the data for data gaps and uncertainty, and then how to focus the geologic data to make the case and risk analysis. And then using the data gaps to communicate the need for additional investigations. So sometimes during the IES process, you have a phase one investigation, and then after you review that data, if there's still a data gap, you can have a phase two investigation. So um, the difference between the SQRA and the QRA process, I guess the biggest difference is the amount of time and budget. The SQRA process, you typically have like a week to kind of go over all the data, build the case, make the case, do your risk driving failure modes, and then you do your risk assessment, and then write up the report. Where a qualitative, you do a much deeper dive, and you're talking a budget of like three to six months. So it's a much more in-depth process where you can really tease out the risk driving failure modes. Those are usually on the much higher um, desaturated dams. So um, when you transition to this more comprehensive uh, dive into the material, one of the things you can do is go to the archives and the national archives. And, and if that's in the budget, you can look at the historical construction photos. You can do a lot of more investigation on some of your primary risk driving failure modes. Um, and that's where you can find some of the integrate old data that you didn't know you had if you didn't have all the um, construction photos and stuff like that. The archives has a lot of data, but you can also find additional regional bed bedrock geologic maps. You can find other sources of data and layer it with your, your um, your project data. And then um, you can talk to additional team members. You can um, integrate geophysical data, um, airborne mag data. There, uh, you, there's a lot of data out there that you can incorporate into your, um, like I mentioned the other day, you can get groundwater wells from the public health department and get water levels for regional wells and then get more of a regional if you have a, a groundwater driving issue. So there's lots of information that you can link to fill in data gaps. Here's an example that um, where you have a layer down there that you don't know if it's continuous and you have offset faults. You need to kind of fill in the data gaps. So that's a conceptual slide that's added. So some of the existed data and data review. This is, um, I believe this is, yeah, Trisagi. Um, you've conducted your desktop study of the site, um, hopefully reviewing all the old topography and geology maps. You've hopefully visited the site to you know, get the size and scale of your problem. Um, you have, you've developed a working hypothesis regarding the structure and the foundation conditions from the basis of design, from um, performance, how it's performed under load conditions, instrumentation, a lot of data sources you have. You've identified potential driver failure modes, and then your working hypothesis to guide and rescour the data. So you have your identified potential failure modes, you have your failure nodes, your tree development, and you can go node by node and analyze what data gaps you have and how they can be filled through trenching, through additional drill borings, 
just any way you can fill the data gaps first cheaply and then cost effectively. And if you have to go out and do additional data, what are the next steps and how, where you're going? So um, you can use Tarsagi's method for uh, characterizing site. It's a fundamental you know, practice that we, we've always done and making the case and you know, following the data, filling data gaps. You study the geology and the geomorphology of the region of the project site. You gather all forms of existing data, um, geologic soils, hydrological, meteorological, identify any of the missing gaps in the geologic information, um, do high ground reconnaissance of the site, note dominant erosional processes, that's aerial photographs and other, other data sources, formulate a working hypothesis regarding the nature of the subsurface conditions, what kind of depositional environment are you in. For the North Springfield Dam um, example I gave yesterday, it was a lake deposit in a glacially uh, glacial lake environment. Um, so that would give us the continuity of those continuous sands for backward erosion and piping. For a landslide, uh, risk drive and failure mode, it might be old land scarps or old landslide evidence from aerial photographs. I mean, you have a lot of different risk drive and failure modes, so your data gaps may be very different. Um, the geology and the geological engineering represent empirical fields that are intrinsically riddled with geological variability and knowledge of uncertainty due to not having a lens into the substrate. So we're, we're basically, you know, how big is your boring? Two, three inches? And how far are they separated? And how much geopoetry are you doing in between? <laughs> That's really what we're talking about. So. Oh. Did I kill it? Uh-oh. Technical. <laughs> All right, got that. All right, here we go. We got it. That integration and portrayal. All right, we've all done cross sections. I think you all did some in the exercise this week. If you hadn't done cross sections, I hope you were uh, drawing some lines and connecting things. You can always make them dashed if you're uncertain, but um, that's where you're starting to do the interpretation. Uh, this is a great quote. I will read it because it's that good. Dams must stand, not all of them do. And there are all degrees of uncertainty about them. Reservoirs must hold water, and there are many ways by which water may be lost. The whole structure must be permanent, and work has a right to be done within the original estimates. Not all of them are. And there are many reasons for their failure or excessive cost. Most of them are geologic. That's pretty true. So geologic uncertainty. So um, typical data that's available, like many of our case studies and, and stuff you've been working on this week, you have a multidisciplinary team to work with. Um, you take time to debate and discuss the potential failure modes between your multi multidisciplinary team. Um, you try to fully understand the failure mode from start to finish, from initiation to breach. You basically take all your inventory data, your photos, your drawings, your logs, your design documents, construction documents, performance documents, uh, inspection during high pool event documents. You spatially look at all that data and compare them to your site maps. I mean, the key, the first thing you should do is check your site map, make sure that thing's rock solid before you start layering your data on it. Once you start laying your data on it, um, at least you know your base map is right and, and you're layering subsequent data that's correct over it. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've looked at some site maps and gone through back through the data and found misposition borings and elevations that are off. So the first thing you should do is <laughs> nail down your site plan, make sure everything's right, and then start laying your data. So you're very competent of all your geologic um, contacts from your, from your borings. Um, know your instrumentation locations, drill holes, geologic other investigations, trenching, trench maps, foundation maps, tunnel maps from outlet structures, any performance issues, as-built drawings. Um, this is huge. 
because sometimes your design drawings, if they don't update to the as built, you may miss your as built may be different than your design drawings. So definitely check that. Geologic contacts and more. So here's all the different disciplines that you'll be working with. I'm sure you already have the experience of chasing money at the project manager. <laughs> he holds the gold, makes the rules. And these are the different geological uh, uh, geological principal engineer, operations staff, lab specialists running the test, cultural environmental specialist, instrumentation engineer, um, and the list goes on. So I hope you're reaching out to specialists if you need their, their specialization during uh, some of your failure mode development if you need it. We have a lot of experts in the course, so reach out. Um, so available data to integrate, um, like we've been discussing, there's boring logs, sections, design reports, construction reports. These are great sources of data because when you start opening up the ground, I mean, what, what was maybe 20, 30 borings is now a full surface excavation. And you can see, especially with trench mapping, you see three-dimensionally how things are deposited, layers, which way the currents are going. Um, I, if you can recall back to my presentation, that picture of the esker, you know, with all the dipping beds going across, and you can tell the current direction, those are gold. I mean, those are really, really gold. So um, instrumentation reports are key. So you see, is the dam forming as designed or the designers intended? Is there anything that the filter's not working or something like that? So you have uh, instrument highs and locations that shouldn't be there. Um, review your aerial photos for depth. Um, Justin covered a lot of the geomorphological features you can find in the aer aerial photos. Your permeability tests, for, um, piezometer data, laboratory testing, any previous risk assessments that were done, regional stereo nets. You got it. I mean, there's a lot of information out there. So pulling all this data together. Well, we don't have we don't specify any hardware, but there's a lot of hardware out there. Um, I've used Rockworks in the past, um, other GIS platforms. I think right now we're venturing into Leapfrog, so I'm starting a new one. I'll tell you how that goes. But, um, so pull all your data together, confirm um, locations of previous and proposed field activities. That's that's kind of what I was hammering home with. Know your, make sure your site plan is right and make sure your borings are in the right place and they're accessible. I'll get to this example in a minute. Site access and requirements. Um, the, you know, some areas are very difficult to drill. This is, I think, the Navajo Dam. And they were putting in an additional, see these outlet works down here. They were going to put another additional outlet work here and they were going to needed to get drilling information off this platform up here. So they had to visit the site, make sure they could get there and get access. So uh, make sure you can actually get to where you want to drill. We have the similar experience right now. I'm working on Lowell Creek on Bear Mountain up in Alaska, and that is a very steep. And to do any of the runs along the tunnel alignment, we'd have to clear forest with a bear guard and uh, a helicopter the rig up the mountain. So we've decided to do photogrammetry on the inlet and the outlet and forego any of the bare stuff and clearing. So you have to adjust your site and what's accessible and what's, what's actually doable. Um, make sure you get to talk to critical people on the site. The on-site personnel will know the daily operations and, and, and what's actually doable in local contacts if you need stuff. The district engineering staff, um, your risk specialist, field exploration team, field geologists, and design team members, all these people need to discuss this project or any project before you start doing it. And you, you start doing this during the dip and fit process, but we'll get to that. But definitely conduct your site visit and start discussing accessibility and um, your potential failure mode of concern. All right, condense and focus your geologic info. Now, this one's very near and dear to my heart because I believe that's Martis Creek Dam. And I worked on that one. So 
there's a lot of information out there. I like this graphic because it, most of it is in paper form. If you're going back through the old construction documents or anything like that, that could be stored on site. They could be in a room and they could look like this. I've seen this. So um, you sometimes have to sort through a lot of documents and make sense out of them. We had a lot of paper documents and a lot of, they had everything on Martis Creek, but it wasn't in electronic format. So we had to go back. The first thing we did is check the site plan, make sure everything was where it was. We noticed that many of the borings had uh, duplicate boring numbers so that they, you didn't know where you were because it was multiple of them had the same labels. So we had to go through and sort them all out. And this is how we layered all the data. And you can see here, you have the piezometric uh, surfaces, you have the CUs, you have the gravel content, you have water levels. Um, we, we put everything in here. Um, just so we could understand, Marsh Creek was a pretty complex. There was two different water tables. And the upper one was in a wash condition. And the lower one, there was a uh, aquitard in between the two water tables. And the lower one was 60 feet lower than the upper one. So we had to really look at what the instruments were telling us and, and how these each abutment was also different. So how everything was interplaying in a three-dimensional space. And that's what our drawing allowed us to do. Um, and convey that information to other people on the team. So we could portray, represent the failure mode and portray an accurate risk and everyone could estimate. Everyone had the same failure mode picture in their mind. That's your goal in presenting and analyzing this data is making sure everyone understands the failure mode, how it's gonna fail and where it's gonna fail. And here's the data to support it. So summarizing a complex geologic relationship, um, this is a landslide example here down in these pictures. So you have your joint orientation from your um, course. You have your picture data showing old scarp surfaces and slide locations. And then you have cross sections that you develop here. So no one piece of evidence has the answer. We need to apply a geologic model of the site. You must think of all the evidence together and how it develop, you develop the geologic picture and the failure mode. And um, we have three, three data sources here. Um, I just presented those to you. What other additional data do you think could be of assistance with this, this landslide example? Anyone? Water. Groundwater, that's it. That's, the, that's usually a triggering mechanism. So the phreatic surface would be huge. And if it's daylighting out at the toe or if it's dropping down, toe conditions, additional toe conditions would be would also be definitely the phreatic surface. So that's that's great. Good, good participation. So we gotta uh, we gotta focus our information. And these are some of the critical questions we gotta ask ourselves. Um, so if we're doing a backward erosion failure mode, you know, what's the susceptibility of this material to erode? What's the coefficient of uniformity? How similar sized is it? Can it move? Um, in order to do this, we got to understand the depositional environment to see if it's continuous. And we got to apply indicators of foundation conditions and performance. And so you start asking questions, you know, what kind of drilling and sampling will we need to do? How big do the samples need to be so we're not biasing? Sample bias can just be done by the size of your, you know, boat diameter of your uh, collection. If you're looking for a large, larger item, like six inch, and you're only drilling a two inch item, usually we're going smaller, but I'm just giving that as a hypothetical case. Your, your boring size can bias your samples, what you're getting. So um, you have to think about that, your geologic vulnerabilities. Um, Migration material for moving. Uh, sometimes you have to do some special laboratory testing. If you're doing in situ tests, you have to get the samples. You wax them, then you send them off. Um, if you're doing geophysical investigations, sometimes you have to use multiple uh, tools in the field to really get the best one in regards to antennas for EM and, and some other stuff. Uh, tracer testing, if you're doing dye testing for a, a, you know, a flow path. And you can do instrumentation analysis. Those are, you know, they look at all the instrumentation over time. You do hysteresis loops with the pools to see how the dam is performing during a load. 
and uh, the continuity of erodible features. So, and then if you're doing instrumentation analysis, you're definitely looking at flow characteristics and groundwater flow from a three dimensional perspective. Examples of critical questions. Um, what is the likelihood of erodible sands or silts that are continuous upstream to downstream? We just kind of covered that one. Is the instrumentation performance indicative of this kind of failure mode? What are you seeing in the instruments? Are they what you expect? And if it's leading to failure, what would that instrumentation response be like? That's important to think of the whole failure mode from start to finish. Um, are there construction photographs that can form our estimates and of the condition? Can we see it in, in the construction photos? Did they do, if it's a, you know, concentrated leak erosion or something, erosion piping through the foundation, did they do um, grounding and mud work in the foundation to make sure there's no cracks or crevices or open joints, you know, stuff like that. What um, were the designers and consultants, were, were they correct about their um, foundation conditions and the design parameters they built the structure? Sometimes after performance data comes around and you learn a lot building it, that, you know, you have to make some design modifications. Um, for example, North Springfield Dam, they did not plan for an esker. And we had to do design modifications until we could actually handle the capacity that that esker was passing. And each time it failed, it was further down the esker. So I anticipate if it's going to fail in the future, it will be further down the esker. So there um, are the drill holes and samples representative of the range of possible conditions. I think these are some of the uh, examples from, was it, what did you say it was, Susie? Grapevine. This is grapevine. This is one of the excavations when they were drilling and they got this, this clay moved in. There was a big uh-oh moment because uh, they went back through the construction photos. I don't know how grapevine turned out, actually, so I'm not going to pontificate. Here's another uh, condensing the information in a meaningful way. Here you're layering your information where your drill holes are from, where the cutoff trench is, where there's a possible issue. This is a grout cap. Did they, did they actually carry the cutoff trench to where it needed to be? Um, is the, no, it, they're assessing if the see, seepage cutoff feature is adequate into an impermeable foundation. So you would look at all your construction photos, put out where the as-built things are, layering them, all your boring information, look at your instrumentation to see if you actually have a cutoff at this location. Or is, are the instrumentations higher on one side or the same all the way through so there's no cutoff at all? So, um, condensing the information in a meaningful way, here it is on a cross section. You're looking at your instrumentation response at various locations. Here's this one over time, and this one's past the cutoff, and it's pretty steady. So, you're making the case with all the information and layering it to convey the, the um, geologic information to all the parties involved. So here's another example. Um, on many of the old um, concrete dams, they, at least in the core, they used to name the shears after the secretary. So here's Martha Shear, Katie Shear, Lena, and they'd, and they'd name the, the uh, intrusive dikes and other, sh other stuff after the inspectors. So you could have Bob Dyke and, you know, so Hazel Shear. So this is how they did it back in the 60s and 70s. I think it was pretty funny. Um, so what other information could you layer on this besides these great shear locations? You could actually layer um, some of the photos onto the side. You could layer any of the instrumentation uplift cells or any of the instrumentation or inclinometers. You could add the groundwater data. You can add all sorts of stuff to, if this is a key block analysis, you could put um, the orientations of the different shear planes and you can put a stereo net up in the corner over here and show how these interact and what your wedge failure condition is. So there's so many ways you can layer the data and this is just one and you just add more data to it to convey, your, and convey the, you know, how the failure mode is going to fail. And Make sure everyone's visualizing it the same for your risk assessment. Make the case. Build your case.
show the evidence. Uh, here's one for AbbQ that uh, Amy's going to talk about, I think, tomorrow. Today? Or next? Oh, that's it. I won't steal any, any of her thunder, but if she's layering a lot of data through cross sections, and here's all the grouting data, and she will get into it, um, what they were looking for voids and, and high permeable zones. Here's a much more simplified look at that. So they're looking at grout data at specific locations near uh, a pervious zone that they were worried about. And so they're just specifying in on specific locations right here for a suspected channel in the sandstone. Um, data gaps and uncertainty. And we've talked about this this week. This is, this is the biggest thing in regards to risk assessment kind of drives a lot. And so the more time and energy and effort expended examine, uh, to examine the subsurface of the site, the more complex the structure, the more complex the geology, the more the, the crazy it appears to be. Some of these are some great quotes. I love this one from Pete. I, I hope you all had the chance to work with Pete. But uh, geology sees their imaginations rooted in experience and case histories to provide a plausible and coherent narrative of characterization of the subsurface despite the large knowledge gaps. So, you know, you're trying to convey everything, but there are, you, you, you recognize there's gaps, but you accept those. Um, never forget it is what you don't recover from your substrate sampling rounds that often is the most important information, and that is true. And then good site characterization involves critical assessment of the geologic and geomorphic setting. Start here first. Um, yeah, if you know exactly the site geomorphology, then it'll help you develop and pinpoint your drilling efforts and what you're looking for in your failure mode characteristics for back erosion piping or, or a lot of your geologic driven failure modes. So um, here's a few tips for identifying data gaps. You can always look at case histories. I think uh, case histories are awesome. Uh, you, can, you can learn so much from them. A lot of them are forensic and after the fact, but you can go back to the design and they'll make the case of why it failed and what the oversights were. And you can use those for improving designs in the future. Um, this one is St. Francis Dam, um, and it echoes the understanding what we learn from case histories. We will not identify just geologic structures which we are not specifically looking for. We have to have in mind that we are seeking and realizing that we will seldom be able to recognize those features with which we have had prior or little experience. Um, so, you know, always call up the old guy. If they have a lot of experience, they'll probably help you out. Now, I'm not selling myself, but I can send you my email contact. Um, understanding what produces the uncertainty in a, in a potential failure mode um, for, for erosion piping, it'll be the variability of the depositional environment along your flow path. Is it continuous? Absolutely continuous. What kind of environment was it? You know, those are some of the questions you're asking yourself when you're filling these data gaps. And, and you will see those visibly, spatially, while you're doing your work because when you're filling out and doing your conceptual site model, you're looking at every boring. You're filling out, you're putting them into your relational database, and you're analyzing the data. You will know where you're missing data, and you'll identify and highlight it with your team. Hopefully, that's your job. That's what we're doing all this for. Um, the, these case histories give you examples of how different geologists handled these situations. So you can be informed if you, you know, encounter a similar situation on your next risk assessment or assignment. Um, rely, re, rely on your multi, multidisciplinary team. I like having a, a, a very diverse team because some team members may approach the problem from a totally different perspective. And you have to appreciate that because it'll help you, and the more you argue about it and, or discuss it, um, the better solution you're going to have. And um, sometimes it can get very heated in some of these uh, uh, IES events, it, it, it's because people are passionate about what they're doing and, and sometimes it can be, it can be, it can get heated. So just remember you're all working for the same goal um, if you're in that situation. Um, 
communicate early and regularly. Um, and I do a lot of visual communication um, with PowerPoint presentations, making the case, showing all the evidence in a PowerPoint presentation for each node. We, I used to do it by node by node and um, collecting the data by node. So when you have to go back, A, you have it labeled where you got it, where it's cited, but it's logically following your potential failure mode and your, your, your logic tree for that event tree. Um, sometimes you can, you, you spray and you can also communicate these by forwarding it to all your other team members. They get to review it, put their notes on it and what they've found and they'll send it back. And then you start a discussion that way. That, a lot of that happened on Martyrs Creek Dam because I was working with Pete Schaffner, Carl Dice, uh, Dr. Schubert, and myself, and, and someone would wake up in the morning with the geologic more thought of the morning and send out an email, and then that would cause a chain reaction about a, a, about a potential failure mode. And it was some of the best communication we had on, on solving a lot of those problems. So communicate with your team members. It's, it's, it, it's an integral part of the process. Oh. So, um, did I miss one? Yeah, Ident I, I just did this. No, Ident a few tips for identifying the data gaps. The site will be evaluated for potential liquefaction. So if you're doing liquefaction, you're looking for N values, you're looking for the depositional environment, you're looking for the thickness of the substrate, you're looking for the location of the groundwater table, you're looking for uh, other orientations around site and their activity. Um, geomorphic understanding the geologic processes that help shape the site. Stratigraphic yeah, continuity and thickness of the susceptible materials. Construction info, as-built info. What did it look like? Did they cut into this material? Any pictures of it? Um, the elevations across the site and the reservation, reservoir elevations. Uh, examples of critical data needs. Yeah, you can drop them in the chat. We don't have a chat. So does anyone have any other critical data thoughts on liquefaction? I'm thinking seismological records, um, USGS maps, just frequency. Bird limits, yeah, I got those. Lab testing. Anything else? CPT or Yep, CPT, depending on depth, but yeah, that would be good. No, I think that's pretty complete. So, we would be do well to examine the attributes necessary for successful practices of subsurface engineering. I think this is a peck. These are at least three knowledges of precedence, familiarity with soil mechanics, and the working knowledge of geology. Of these familiarity precedents is by far the most important. Yeah, Peck. He's he's one of the uh, the fathers of soil mechanics. So I I listen to him. So here's uh, another case example: Camara Dam. I think Todd did, Todd had this in his presentation earlier. I think it was a foundation rock wedge that failed right here, causing a large breach. Uh, I think there were five deaths and. 3,000 displaced people. Um, they basically rushed the construction for political gain. Uh, I don't think they had a proper design, and this was the result. So um, many times these features may not be noticeable um, if you're not looking for them, and this is a perfect example. So yeah, if they had looked at the St. Francis Dam failures, it may have guided them to a different design that could have avoided this. All right, so characterizing uncertainty. Um, you know, that's what we're always trying to do when we're doing our geologic or geo, geologic poetry, geo poetry. We're trying to connect the dots, whether they're straight lines dashed or whether they have a little question mark in them. We're always trying to like this, we're always trying to fill in the dots to, to, to fill in the picture. Um, and we, we, as geologists, should be able to communicate this with sampling, with cross-sections, with um, other evidence. 
uh, aerial photos, whatever you need to make the case. And um, I mean, without uncertainty, we'd be 100% positive we wouldn't need a risk assessment, correct? So <laughs> we're always going to be dealing with it because we don't have 100% coverage. So portraying your uncertainty and really that's that's what you're doing when you're doing your risk assessment for each failure mode, for each node along your event tree. So you use and lay your data to make the case for each node along your event tree so you can reduce uncertainty as much as possible so your risk assessment value actually makes sense. And they're all clustering. You don't have all these wide variables. Like you have one person saying it's a one and you have another person saying it's 10 to the minus eight. So here's how one way to characterize the uncertainty. Um, no, hold on. For all evidence collected, assess the representativeness of that data. How how repeatable is the data? You know, consider the pre-dam topography and geomorphology when assessing the spatial coverage of the data. Could they get to every location, or where their borings kind of primarily where they can get the drill rig? Um, Consider when the drilling was tested and done. Um, I know pre-1967, 68, they could use dynamite during blasting. So some, on some of the drill logs I used to review from some of the old borings, they would say, you know, one pop, two pop, three pop. Well, that was three sticks of dynamites, three pop, down the hole to remove something they couldn't get by, which was usually nested boulders or cobbles. So. You know, when you're reading a, a, a log and it says pop one or one pop two pop, it's kind of confusing until you finally figure out they're using dynamite. But that was, uh, you know, you don't see that after 1968. But that also helps you, you know, this was really difficult drilling conditions. So, you know, that jumps out at you and you see that in a site, you know now what it was. But um, consider the area when they're drilling, sampling, um, SPTs, what the weight, is it a hammer drop, is it an automatic hammer? Was the automatic hammer, hammer equilibrated before testing began? You know, questions like that. What material is uh, likely difficult to sample and test? I mean, can you get the sample? It, will it be in situ? Will it not? What special sampling techniques do you have to do? Is there enough testing to provide a range of accepted material properties? Do you have a statistic good enough body to make, you know, a st statistical statement? Um, remains unknown and related to pre dam conditions versus foundation excavation and treatment. This would be for like foundation cutoff. Um, you have a lot of stuff in, you know, when they do the foundation mapping and exposure of the foundation, there's a lot of information there and it's record keeping and inspection. If you have really good inspectors notes and photographs, you can pretty much see how well the construction was done and how well they did the cutoff. Um, if you sometimes you don't always have that. So um, how fo to focus the geology data? Typically, um, as new information becomes available, you kind of put it in this little this little loop here. You use the data, and how does it improve your site characterization? Apply the knowledge of the geomorphology gained from the new data, and then create a detailed. So how does it go into your current conceptual site model? How does it affect your failure mode? And it's kind of like that same thought process. Um, the majority of dam problems and risk are related to geology of the foundation and, and, the, and its engineering properties. I think in the in the concrete dams, the foundation which failure was around fifty something percent, and then the subsurface conditions for embankment dams was around forty something percent. So it's roughly fifty percent of the, the conditions are for geology and the foundation. Um, use case histories to better understand failure modes and to also help you in analyzing your own. Here's some examples for backward erosion and piping. Um, your failure mode is here, your cross section is here, you're looking for continuity through the sand. Here you're looking at low CU values, right in here, right in here, to see if you have continuity all along your whole failure path. It looks like you do on the ends, but not in the middle. Um, here's another one for concentrated leak erosion. Here you're looking at around a conduit and compaction, whether you have low, con and, and then here's some instrumentation around the conduit. You can see how it fluctuates. Um, so there might be an issue. And here's the geologic section along that conduit. 
illustrating the failure path. And then here's the instrumentation that is associated with the concentrated leak erosion. Um, spillway erosion, I think this is Guadalajara. This is down in Puerto Rico. Here's a spillway. Um, they had a landslide, a historic landslide that went across the spillway. Um, excessive flows during one of the hurricanes caused this thing to start spiraling back and erode. And here's some of the geologic sections to illustrate the variability of the landslide material as well as what was happening. Um, I encourage you to discuss this problem with Todd Lohr in the back of the room. He was there, I was not. Um, so using data gaps to communicate the need for additional site investigations. Um, here you're layering all your data, here's all your borings, here's your site. You're looking at all your data and you're looking right in here and you're missing some data here and then maybe over here. So you start with your plan and profile, you look at your zones of interest, your distress features, any other pertinent information, you look at it and see where you're missing data. Um, from data gap to field investigation, you know, consider non-intrusive, well, this is intrusive, it's a trench, but um, big trenches, a lot more data in a trench than boring. But it's near surface, you have some limitation. Determine the type of investigation you're doing it's in regards to the boring, the, the diameter of your boring size. Um, document anticipated materials that will be encountered. You usually do this ahead of time. Then review the, your laboratory testing program, review the instrumentation and borehole uh, requirements, and then consider your accessibility and other issues for drilling. And this is where we get into the dip, dip and FIP. Um, the dip goals, the drilling plan goals are to basically do no harm. You got to basically propose the purpose of your investigation. You're going to explain how the information will be obtained via drilling, trench, how are you collecting the information. Even if it's not intrusive with geophysics, um, you're going to obtain, but typically this you, you have to penetrate, so you don't have to do with geophysics. I take that back. So you obtain the information needed, you backfill and seal the holes without disrupting the structure, and um, document what you did for future reference and information for future risk assessments. Um, the DIP contains the objective, the exploration team requirements, all the ex existing information, sensor, geologic and engineering drawings to make the case for why you need the drilling, all the activities, what you're doing on site, the risk evaluation, what could possibly go wrong, and then your DSLO stamp on the bottom for approval. Now, FIP is basically an enhanced dip because years you're doing the FIP during the phase one or phase two uh, IES. So you would basically, it's like a dip on steroids. You're, you're basically showing how the investigation is focused on that failure mode, and you can go to a nodal analysis and show how you're going to reduce uncertainty by collecting like these four borings and then how it's going to support your estimates. And then you put those details on the targeted failure modes and your uncertainties that how they will reduce the uncertainties and get a better risk assessment. You then you look at invasive or non-investigation techniques. You include a cost and schedule for all activities. And then you review the uh, RMC geological site investment SMEs. We review it. We give your stamp of approval. Here's uh, making the case. We've talked about this. Establish high quality feature records, develop site records and reduce potential for subsequent redundant studies. Develop products to help transfer knowledge to risk assessment teams and reviewers and decision makers through cross sections. Your use of your conceptual site model. Um, Data must be consolidated to capture essential geologic information to support your conclusions. Again, making the case. All your instrumentation is a backward erosion and piping. You show the continuity. You show the instrumentation. You show that there's not a filtered exit. You show the problem. Um, uncertainty must be constrained. Um, if it's needlessly high, work to reduce it. Uh, the multidisciplinary approach. 
Um, here we have a, this is a, a sheer example, site characterization. So they did dye testing to show the failure path. Here you can see it's all red down here in the channel. You can see the borings. They looked at fracturing field and shear to develop the shear zone and they did some geophysics. They layered all that data to look at the primary failure mode um, of a shear along this abutment. Geologists must remain cognizant of pitfalls to the risk analysis process. Just because it's plausible doesn't mean it's probable. We should continue to refine our awareness of the probability with experience and knowledge of case histories. Um, I like to say just because you can imagine it doesn't mean it's going to happen is a better way to put it. I can imagine a lot of things, but doesn't mean they're going to happen. So um, as new information becomes available, we should remain skeptical and avoid confirmation bias. This is something geologists understand well and should continue to refine. Um, continuity is a good example of that. The more samples you get along your flow path, the better you can define the continuity. Uh, why geology is often the key to condition unfavorable or conceivable deviations, the root cause of uncertainty in context of what is observed or processes that are understood. So the depositional environment. And then um, using a well-facilitated SME team, so you can a well-rounded team, so you can look at some of these complex problems from a multidisciplinary approach. So knowledge check. Um, what's the difference between SQRA and a QRA? Anyone? Anyone? Yes. <laughs> Schedule and budget. <laughs> Um, how about uh, the difference between a dip and a dip? Yeah. All right, we're running into that. So, any questions? So, we, I've, I've been a part, I'm relatively new, but I've been a part of multiple SQRAs. Yep. And usually we um, recommend what field investigations to do, write a report on it, but like we don't actually. Get to go do it? Yeah. Well, I was, you know, I'm just wondering, like, for a QRA, do you recommend that they go do it and then come back within the same QRA? Is that kind of the... Well, yeah. So, you usually have a, a multi-phase, like a phased approach. You have a phase one where you go out and if you have to, if it's a DSAC one or two, you have to go out and do some investigation to better define the risk and see if it's really a DSAC one or two. And if you really get some <laughs> compelling information that kind of makes you more scared, <laughs> you may go out and do additional drilling for a phase two. Okay. So it can be multi-phased. And that's sometimes you get enough information, say, you know what? I think we got enough data. So it really depends. All right, thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you. <laughs>